Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm John Lovett. I'm Tommy Vitor. On today's show, Ron DeSantis kicks off his presidential campaign in waiting with a nationwide book tour. We quickly run through the week's top stories in a new segment we're calling One Line with Cocaine Bear. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Oh, we're doing okay. We're doing it there. I love Great. doing it there. Okay. Uh, MSNBC's Mehdi Hassan stops by to talk about how Democrats can win more arguments, and we decide who gets what in Marjorie Taylor Greene's national divorce. Uh, but first, we are relaunching Vote Save America's No Off Years program for 2023, and it's starting with that must-win Supreme Court seat that we've been talking about in Wisconsin. Uh, the election is April 4th. And you can help right now wherever you live by going to votesaveamerica.com. Sign up for no off years. You can donate, make phone calls, volunteer, get involved. Votesaveamerica.com. Get to it. Get to best. it. Hey, <laughs> get to it. Uh, before we get to the show, guys, I ran Whoa. into um, a very important friend over the weekend. We're off we wanted to check in, gonna be. see how everyone's doing, uh, and, and just deliver a message to you guys. So oh, here we boy. go. Oh, boy. Hey, friends of the pod, it's Joe Biden. Look, I know you haven't heard from me in a while, and there's rumblings that it's because of some lingering hard feelings from the primary. Here's the deal. That's good. Did Joe Biden like it when Lovett said he had a better chance of winning Powerball than I did of becoming president? <laughs> I didn't say that. No, Joe did not. <laughs> Joe didn't like did it. Did Joe Biden find it funny when Favreau said my South Carolina event looked like a party at a discount funeral home? <laughs> No, Joe did not. Did Joe Biden chuckle in Nevada when Tommy said the last time he saw a socialist deliver a beating like that, it was a Sandinista? Actually, that was pretty funny. But today I'm here to say that's all malarkey under the bridge. Nice. We've got to get serious, folks. 24 is coming quick. The soul of our nation is at stake, and I literally mean that, literally. If we want to build an economy from the bottom up and the middle out, oh, no. from the nethermost to the tippy top, <laughs> from the center along an orthogonal radii to the periphery of the Euclidean space we call the middle wow. class, That's good. then we have to work together. Really good. So I'm here today to say Biden will be back on Pod Save America this year. That's not hyperbole, folks. Biden out. Hey, good news. Great that was news. Great. That was great. Pretty cool. Thanks for getting that note. I just saw him at Starbucks. You wow. recorded it right into your phone. Um, wow. That was obviously fake. That was artificial intelligence. Before uh, anyone okay. gets well, before anyone, game away. Well, yeah. Yeah, people will be clipping that and sending it around <laughs> in no time. Great. <laughs> From a site called Eleven Labs, I paid $5 uh, to make it. Actually, 22 because I blew through my limit before I got to a final text. But uh, yeah, those jokes aren't real either. We, I mean, we made those up, I think. He's not agreed to come on the show, but boy, will this be dangerous in elections going forward. I, apparently, there's, a, I think, a, someone on Twitter made an account and then a clip of one of the candidates in the uh, Chicago mayoral race oh, God. saying something completely wrong. And then, like, it got sent around, and then they had to take down the tweet, and they took down oh, the no. account eventually. So it's already starting. It's yeah, really going to be bad. Um, before we move yeah, on. I think we can handle it. <laughs> before we move on to the, act, the actual show, I actually did run into one other friend. Oh, my, my God. God. Oh, my God, Tommy. <laughs> Real quick. Hey, fellas, it's Barack. Uh, oh, Jesus no. Christ. I just heard the great news about landing the Biden interview later this year. Congrats. <laughs> Look, I was talking to Michelle about this, and she agrees. But we wanted to let you know that we, too, found the jokes Joe mentioned to be lacking. <laughs> the arc of the moral universe is long, oh, oh, no. but it's got to bend towards better material than that. <laughs> yep. What I have said is that it would serve you well to be funnier yeah. and to reject the notion that this is the best you can do. Okay. Fortunately, I am a much better speechwriter, podcaster, and joke writer than any of you. Yeah. But unfortunately, I, that, I will be unavailable to help out going forward. Regardless, congrats on all the success at Crooked Media. Vote Save America is the shit. Obama, out. Tell me, were you an Obama speechwriter? That, <laughs> I don't know. That sounded a lot like him. I gotta say, it turns out actually, just once you put the spin on it, really anybody can do it. <laughs> <It's tough>. Tell, <laughs> it's tough. Telling us our material is lacking is that real. Feels, that's feels, pretty close. It felt pretty. My, my yeah. stomach hurts. Yeah, <laughs> I got a little. I got a little yeah, knot. Flashback to that gotta, immigration speech, yeah. huh? Hey, 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 hey! Now, hey, hey! Come on, we're just having fun here. Should we do the show? Yeah, if I played with that website any longer over the weekend, I was getting divorced. Yeah, there was by my own quite a few, well. quite a few other ones yeah, going on. <laughs> anyway, Ron anyway, Sanders or something. All right, uh, let's start with the latest developments in the 2024 Mess America pageant. Ron DeSanctimonious never surrender to the woke. So 
That was so A lot loud. of clips today, that guys. Was so loud. A lot of clips. Wow. Oof. All right. Uh, DeSantis is kicking off what appears to be a pre presidential announcement, MAGA Media Tour, for his new book, The Courage to Be Free, which the New York Times is calling Culture War Mad Libs with a dull coldness at its core that reads like a politician's memoir churned out memoir churned out by chat GPT. Mm-hmm. The theme today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, DeSantis is scheduled to visit dozens of cities in the coming weeks after his political committee hosted a retreat last weekend at a Palm Beach Four Seasons just four miles from Mar-a-Lago. Wow. Uh, that included everyone from Tom Cotton and former Trump chief of staff Mick Mulvaney to the libs of TikTok lady and Laura Ingram. <laughs> Uh, But the other Florida man still presents a formidable challenge for DeSantis. Trump is still leading in most of the current polling, including a new one from Fox News that has the former president at 43 percent, DeSantis at 28 percent, Nikki Haley and Mike Pence of Hang Mike Pence fame at 7 percent, and everyone else at 2 percent or below, including your boy, Mike Pompeo. I know. I love it. I love that he's Um, in there. Let's start with what's sure to become uh, the greatest political memoir of our generation, Um. What jumped out at you guys from DeSantis's book reviews or interviews about his book in terms of his message or strategy for this primary? Love it. Uh, well, first of all, I, I these books aren't real books. I think people these aren't this. The book doesn't the, t- the book tour doesn't exist to promote the book. The book exists to promote the tour. Like the reason Mike Pompeo wrote a book uh wasn't really to sell books and good for him because he didn't. <laughs> well, he bought them all. His yeah. pack bought like 40 grand worth. It's to create a reason to have press people reach out to book you on shows exactly. and talk about the content of the book, the content of the book being M- Mike Pompeo idea. rules. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a cynical enterprise. It's a little, little book called Audacity of Hope that did pretty well. Well, he's the exception. <laughs> he's the exception, famously. <laughs> famously the exception. Uh, I don't know that there was anything, actually, based on the reviews, I do think this book is like right in the fucking center of the target of exactly the kind of shit Ron Santos Ron DeSantis would would produce. I suppose maybe there's a little bit of like he doesn't really engage in the fight with Trump. He goes out of his way to say something kind of vaguely pleasant about him in the book, mm. but I don't know that you would expect him to do anything else. I didn't find I just so far there's nothing particularly surprising. He's taken on the woke mob. Uh he's done a really good job in Florida. That's his message. Yeah. That I think that's exactly right. I have not and will not read the book. Absolutely <laughs> not. Absolutely not. Be clear about that. Are you going to read it? Yeah, I'm going to have a book report. You're going to read all of it? Guys, yeah. yeah, but I mean, what, what I've read about the book, woke well, ideology is bad, Florida good, generic biography. It was interesting that he didn't pick a fight with Trump. Obviously, like a book's not the place you do that. He is doing this press tour. He recently went to New York, Pennsylvania, and Illinois to do uh, law and order message events with cops. He's not going to see back. I thought that was interesting. So I think it's all building in anticipation to when he decides to go to an early state. That's the book tour. I, from the reviews and the excerpts and everything, you really get why Donald Trump has uh, nicknamed him Ron De- Ron De Sanctimonious. <laughs> like the guy really does think of himself as well. Did you guys remember the video? Yes. that was put out around God the created so I, Ron DeSantis listen, on the we, seventh day. We have a clip of this. And on the eighth day, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, "I need a protector." Ugh. So God made a fighter. God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, kiss his family goodbye, travel thousands I mean, of miles for never no other it. reason than oh, to it's, serve it's unbelievable. the people, to save their jobs, their livelihoods, their liberty, their happiness. All right, we can stop it. I would just, can we, can we stop this? I so think that God. there's something important by the, in the existence of this and in the sanctimoniousness you're describing, which is, I believe Ron DeSantis was married at Disneyland or Disney World. This is true. And there, there is... Um, Disney adult energy inside of that, <laughs> inside of that sanctimonious I, horseshit. I couldn't believe like that, that they, that was their video that, that his wife tweeted and it's, it's, it's called, it's like, I, I just can't believe he's yeah. that obvious about it. And on the ninth day, God sent a puker, me, <laughs> to puke all over the place. I mean, I think that <laughs> about that video. Yeah, yeah, or Disney World, or Disney World. Here's the thing: he is. It's clear he wants to lean in hard to, to like to take on institutions and not just government and academia and the media, which like all Republicans do, but also corporations. Right? That was his fight with Disney. Um, and his rationale here: he's trying to invent a rationale for it, which is, well, it's okay. It, it, I know that I'm supposed to be libertarian, but and, and and limited government and all that. But because all these institutions now are controlled by the left, it's okay for government to get involved. I think the danger for him in doing that, especially in a general election, is 
Um, he seems like a person who thinks he knows better than everyone else. So instead of all these institutions having the power, now Ron DeSantis has the power, right? So it's like, don't trust these institutions. Trust me, Ron DeSantis. I want to control what books you read, what your kids learn, how your company gets involved in politics. Yeah. And I think that's a it's, a, it's a bit of a weakness. It's not libertarian. He, yeah, there's a... He, he he does this dodge right where he says, well, once these public once these uh, uh, corporations start acting very political, they kind of usurp the power of the democracy by doing things that they weren't elected to do, which is I suppose have opinions. It's all very very murky. It's not very like it's not um it's not cogent or anything. Not very well. But he out. starts to say things like, well, if banks decide to not loan money to to gun manufacturers, that's a that's a way of the banks anti democratically trying to restrict gun rights. Right. And basically what it what it amounts to is if you disagree with me, you're doing something anti-democratic. Right, yeah. But I, I imagine he wouldn't say that uh, if the uh, insurance company refuses to uh, cover serious illness, that they're infringing on your right to live. Well, the, well <laughs> sure. These right? guys are also at the same time, the other side of their mouth, they're trying to ban ESG investing, which is when companies invest in companies that have environmentally sustainable portfolios, blah, blah, blah. So they're just they're just using it as a vehicle to attack the left. There's no consistency. Well, there's no consistency. And I, I actually do think. Underneath all of it is all the right wingers who want to get behind Ron DeSantis. They basically just assume, yeah, yeah, he's going to say this kind of shit, but he's not going to come after the money. You know, he's going to attack Disney, which is one company, and he's going to go after the schools and the trans kids and the gay kids and the teachers. But he's not coming after the money. Well, we're here for the money. And that's another big part of the book, which is there's a lot about the Florida economy and the Florida miracle and all that stuff like that, mm-hmm. because he does want to reassure it's partly a general election strategy and partly for the people you're talking about, all of the like Elon Musk's of the world. Well, maybe, it's not even the, it's, not even Elon Musk. The sort of like the uh, like the finance bros. It's the it's the it, it, <laughs> it runs from the, it runs from the the finance bros to the conservatives who have tolerated the evangelicals for 40 years because of the tax rates to the Jeb Bushes who all want to tell themselves that the stuff that Ron DeSantis does when he goes in front of a press comp, goes in front of a school and says, we're going to stop the wokeness and we're going to attack the critical race theory and all that, that they kind of see that as a little song and dance he does to make the other stuff possible. And as long as that's how it feels, it's like Trump. I mean, it's like every, it's the Republican playbook for the last 50 years. And if he gets through the primary, I imagine he will pivot hard to being that guy over the culture. Yeah, it'll be fewer schools, more gas stations. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) That's what it'll be. uh, What'd you guys make of the, uh, what'd you guys make of the collection of uh, MAGA goons at the uh, Ron Curious Confab or uh, some of the early support DeSantis has been getting from donors, activists, and uh, most importantly, Jeb. I, I like that some of the really effect. Oh yeah, let's hear let's oh. hear Jeb. Let's hear Jeb. Sorry, he's been a really effective governor. He's young. I think we're on the verge of a generational change in our politics. I kind of hope so. I think it's time for a more forward-leaning, future-oriented uh, c- conversation in our politics as well. I liked how some of the reporting made it like this head-to-head battle. I was like, can you believe DeSantis had a meeting in Florida? I was like, well, he's the governor. I mean, it's like, oh, four miles from Mar-a-Lago. I'm sorry. I didn't realize that Trump owned the state. I like, I thought it was an impressive group, right? He had the governor of Tennessee, Oklahoma, <laughs> Kim Reynolds. Impre- loosely defined. Loosely. <laughs> for, for him, <laughs> right? Context, yeah. The governor of Iowa. He met with this guy, Bob Vander Plaats, who's this Iowa conservative group leader. Like, you don't carve out an hour for that dude unless you're running for president, right? Um, there were some less impressive people, Ron Johnson, Tom Cotton. Cotton, Chip Roy, Mick Mulvaney, Laura Ingram. It wasn't like some historic massive event for a governor, but I think it did communicate like I got a network, I can raise some money. Jeb probably has, you know, can unlock some uh, some of that big donor cash that helped him raise $100 million for his super PAC Look, I think he lit on fire. I think the Jeb endorsement is the kiss of death. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. I don't think Ron DeSantis will ever mention that again. But you know who was going to mention that Trump, every Trump. day from now until the primary? Right. Well, Donald Trump. And, and look, the topics of this thing were election integrity, border security, and medical authoritarianism. Right. He's yeah, just no. right the Trump sort of message territory. I, what's interesting to me is that um, all of these people, at, it's not like 16 where there was a bunch of Republicans who didn't like Trump and then they fell in line when Trump won the nomination. These are all people who have loved Donald Trump and maybe still do love Donald Trump. And now they're all sitting there at a not afraid of Donald Trump at all, by the way. Like the, now Donald Trump knows all these people who are at this Ron DeSantis thing and they don't give a shit. They just went anyway. They went anyway. I think they Laura get... Ingram, Benny Johnson, like a lot of the MAGA media stars are there. I think I'm they get you. to I get I think they can all claim to be Ron curious. 
and that they they love Donald Trump and they love Ron DeSantis and it's a great big party with wonderful people and we're going to figure not, it out. It's not how they've acted for the last yeah. several years. Sure, <laughs> Trump about, obviously about Donald Trump. Trump likes nothing more than when you come crawling back. The thing about the thing about also doing it by Mar a Lago, you know, in Elden Ring, sometimes the way you take on the biggest of adversaries mm-hmm. is you have to get right up next to them. Sure, but you think you can you can think you can pull away? No, you got to get real close. And people don't know that. Did sure. you guys know the Trump Super PAC is called MAGA Inc.? That is literally true. It's just a. It's I thought it was a, called uh, Save America. Well, there's one called MAGA Inc. Oh. that was talked about in this uh, in these stories in the Washington Post in particular as sort of the competing event that happened the same weekend as this big DeSantis thing. It's interesting. Um, so the Post story also has uh, anonymous Republicans who've met with DeSantis saying that he, quote, remains stilted in one-on-one conversations and struggles to make small talk or appear enthusiastic. Who among us? <laughs> <laughs> um, how much do you think that matters? I mean, listen, this might come as a surprise to some listeners, but I don't have a ton of connections in the DeSantis orbit. You know, I'm not like, spending a lot of face time with the guy. He does seem like a brooding kind of stilted weirdo at times. Mm. Uh he clearly seems to get his rocks off by being very mean to people, especially kids. But he also... Well, that's a uh, plus in the primary. He won a lot of elections. He's raised a lot of money. Like, yes, I think in the early states, you're going to have to glad, glad hand and, you know, kiss ass and win over people in small settings. But uh, I'm a little skeptical of this narrative, given his success. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Trump is uniquely good at this element of politics, though, right? He, he calls people all day long every day. His events are just pure entertainment for a lot of people. So there's someone found a narrative about Ron DeSantis and they're they're driving at it because uh, it highlights something that Trump thinks he's good at. I think it's a reminder that Ron DeSantis is really untested as a national figure. He hasn't done a lot of the kind of more <laughs> social things that you're going to do when you become a presidential candidate. Uh, and he is going to ultimately have to become the Republican nominee by standing side by side with Donald Trump on a debate stage. He has not been a he he is he is not one because he's a great debater. There's some pretty weird clips going around from when Ron yeah. DeSantis went again, went up against Charlie Chris, for example. Uh, it didn't end up ultimately mattering, but it doesn't mean he won those debates. So I, I do think it's like, you know, we'll see. I mean, on the one hand, you know, Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump, Biden, all really great retail politicians shaking hands one on one kind of thing. So it, you know, it is a quality that a lot of the previous presidents have had. On the other, I wonder, and I know you talked about this a lot in 2020 with in Iowa. Like, there's a, I feel like there's a lot less retail politicking these days. Um, yeah, there, it, it happens. It just mattered less in 2020. It matters less. The national narrative mattered more for these Democratic primary candidates. So right. who knows if that'll be the case? And in, that's what I Iowa. well, that's what I wonder if that papers over some of DeSantis's weaknesses in this because a lot more of the primary happens online with. Tweets, video clips, speeches, all that kind of stuff. Like, I don't, I don't know if, if like being a little aloof in person matters as much anymore. You, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> yeah. One point DeSantis makes, which is uh, that the reason he has been so relentless in doing these press conferences of kind of changing the story and kind of coming up with something to go up and go in front of a, you know, to do a, a, a COVID press conference, to do a schools press conference, whatever, is that um, it. It keeps the story. It keeps the story where he wants it, and he's been very, very. That's like that is his medium. His medium is as governor standing up, making some fucking hellish announcement, uh, getting progressives all spun up about it, getting national coverage about it. And when that coverage dies, dies down, figuring out the next one. Like, is that a recipe to run for president, or is that a recipe to be a successful governor who looks like a great presidential candidate? I don't know. So, what happens when he doesn't have that as a national figure? And, it, and there's a lot of, there's, you know, maybe retail doesn't matter as much day to day, but now he's, there's a video of him being a schmuck at a deli and that's everywhere. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So Trump has been previewing his argument against DeSantis on uh, Truth Social saying, uh, here, here's one truth as an example. Uh, Ron DeSanctimonious wants to cut your social security and Medicare and is an establishment globalist who loves rhinos, Paul Ryan, Jeb Bush, and Karl Rove. Uh, what do you think of that hit? And what do you do about it if you're DeSantis, Tommy? So Trump's 2020 budget cut Medicaid or, or proposed cutting Medicaid, Social Security and Medicare. So does it, he can make this attack on DeSantis if he wants, but there's a pretty easy rejoinder there just sort of sitting. The Rhino stuff is fine. I'm sure Trump will try it out. I'll see what sticks. But I think the threshold question is, do these voters think DeSantis is a rhino? I kind of doubt that. He seems like their second favorite culture warrior. And DeSantis can also say, was I a rhino when you endorsed me? Or he could say... Maybe we shouldn't attack other Republicans because that's how we lose like we did in Georgia. So I think I, I don't know. I think he's flailing a little bit. 
I think the establishment cuck piece of that is going to be a bit stronger than the rhino piece of that. I think that like you're the you're going to be the candidate of your Jebs and your Paul Ryan's is going to be the place where he can where there's a bit of a softer, softer belly there. Well, so uh, Sarah Longwell, who's been on the pod before, she has this uh, excellent podcast called The Focus Group, and she's been interviewing Trump voters who are like open to alternatives, but still like Trump. Mm -hmm. And for a while, it's just like, oh, we love DeSantis. We love DeSantis. And then she said recently she's heard in these focus groups a lot of these voters being like ah, DeSantis's record it's a little establishment I'm not sure Ooh, like some like of the it. establishment cock- it, it's there we go I, I think that's his but she also asked about the um the Trump groomer attack and they were like I mean that's just ridiculous that sounds like Trump, Trump something that Trump always says about everyone <laughs> like go. no one took it seriously and they were just like that's Trump being Trump but the I'm establishment wrong. thing is a I think it's a real danger and I think if Trump can connect for DeSantis, I think if Trump can connect him to McConnell, to, he's going to use all of his votes in in the House. He's going to, you know, I think it's a, I think that is the danger. And, and then, I, and then it turns the endorsements that that DeSantis will ultimately get from a lot of figures as a kind of turns it from, and positive into a negative. And I think I think Trump wants the race to be like populist outsider versus establishment. He wants DeSantis to be the establishment. DeSantis will try to prove his populist outsider credentials by doing the like. I'm attacking the woke mob and Disney and the corporations and all that kind of stuff. But I think he wants to make the race all about electability and generational change. So he doesn't want he doesn't want to be in the frame of, oh, no, no, no. Trump's the establishment. I'm the outsider. Like, yeah. Because yeah. I don't think you're going to win that against Donald Trump. Yeah, he doesn't um, like that argument. I think I you are going to be able to win an electability generational change argument against Donald Trump. So he's going to want to make yeah, that. I think you frame. just do the classic, like, I was a governor who was actually in charge of things and had to run a state. And here's my record. We grew this. We did that. Like, you can call me names if you want. But here's my record. Yeah. And I, you're and you're a loser. And you lost to Joe Biden. That's the that's that's yeah. to him. That's I think his best attack. So, you know, Trump is, as always, a raptor testing the fences. He's seeing what works. He threw out the groomer thing, took it for a spin. Did it work right away? No. Does that mean he's going to abandon it? Does that mean he's going to yeah. hit it? again and again for a while until it's in the back of people's minds. I don't know. There was the, you know, there was the report that he started using meatball Ron. Is he trying to see if there's just a little anti-Italian prejudice just left right under the surface for some of those Jews? You know, just like some of those South Florida guys get just enough to make a difference. He's trying it out. He wants to test it out. We'll see. Well, none of Trump's most effective or famous attacks are like purely about policy. There's always some kind of a character thing to this. By the end, we were all like, did Ted Cruz's dad kill Kennedy? <laughs> like, <laughs> wait, I thought he did. And so it. I do think that like <laughs> think he, he wants us to think of Ron DeSantis as sort of like an aloof weirdo establishment. He's going to yeah. put all that together. Yeah. You know, it's a, like yeah, he, you know, what, what are you doing with this guy? And there's we'll and nothing will be able to stop Donald Trump from bringing up the teacher. Weird things happened. I don't know. I don't know yeah, during yeah. a debate that's coming. Um, we'll see. Um, so one reason DeSantis hasn't formally announced yet is that he wants to leave his mark on the current Florida legislative session, which now includes, thanks to DeSantis, a bill to put state colleges under full control of DeSantis political appointees. And the bill the bill would also ban all gender studies as well as all diversity, equity and inclusion programs in state colleges and universities. Um, this will obviously endear him. Uh, to the base in the primary. How do you think it plays with most people? Like, should Democrats be calling this out? Yes, I, I, I do think this is a similar dynamic to what played out in the midterms. This is something that plays for the base, but it is part of the kind of radicalism, extremism. You know, there was that story out of Michigan about that focus group laughing when this question of bathrooms came up. It's not a concern people have. It's attacking something that people don't actually view as a real and serious problem in their lives. It just seems like right wing weird behavior. And it seems extreme. It seems draconian. It seems anti-democratic. And I think it will be a part of the case we make. Yeah, like, congratulations, DeSantis. You got all the gender studies majors. You got them. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just a weird... It's, geez, yeah. it's, it's very try hard. I mean, I, I, you know, it's funny, John. I, I was thinking about this question. I had this sort of a similar take that you had at the top, which is DeSantis tries to define what he's doing here in the most sort of like unarguable way possible. So he says that state colleges and universities have to, quote, promote the values necessary to preserve the constitutional republic. No one's going to fight with that. Yeah. And they cannot define American history as, quote, contrary to the creation of a new nation based on universal principles stated in the Declaration of Independence. I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what that means either. But like, rather than sort of like engage on the specifics there, I would like to see someone test the message that is a little more libertarian, which is to, which is to say like, Ron DeSantis is trying to 
put politicians fully in control of your kid's education. Yeah. He is trying to handpick who gets to be a teacher and who doesn't. And you might like that when Ron DeSantis is in charge, but what happens when it's AOC, right? Like that's kind of like the and, and I universal think way to shoot at this. You don't like the gender studies classes? Don't take them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't like what this professor's doing or that professor thinks? Don't take that professor. Right. Like that. That should be. And, and Ron DeSantis, he only wants his political appointees yeah. in charge of education. You don't want to pull Teachers decide what to teach, not politicians. Doctors decide how to do medicine, not politicians. Uh, let the schools decide. Let parents decide. Like that is the place where we will, I think, appeal to the most people. And I do also think, too, like DeSantis has played this game over the past couple of years where he does one of these press conferences. He speaks it, speaks about it in the most general terms possible. People look at the bill. They find out it's pretty heinous, uh, progressive. Uh, uh, activists and people engaged on social media go bo- go ballistic correctly. Uh, either they outright lie about the bill or they amend the bill and then they claim, oh my God, Ron DeSantis is once again being unfairly maligned. Look what he's done to his critics. He's made his critics go wild. I do think we have to watch out for that too. Yeah. So uh, there are quite a few other stories out there this week. We figured we'd run through quickly uh, with a short take for each. And in honor of uh, last weekend's box office smash, we're calling this segment... One line with Cocaine Bear. Uh, Jesus. Every time it is so loud. Uh, Uh, All right. So here's each story is written down on a slip of paper that we will take turns pulling out of this trusty bear head that Tommy brought to the office. Take them all out. My friend from college, Carl, uh, made this. So thanks, Carl. Yeah. For those of you who are watching on YouTube, and if you're just listening to the pod, you might want to get on YouTube and watch this because there's a big bear head on the table. I think he used to sell these to people going to like Coachella and stuff. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, all right, so we're all going to take one, and then we're going to give a quick take, uh, each of us. Who wants to start? Who wants to start? Tommy, Tommy, kick it off. Kick it off, buddy. Okay. You know which one I want. <laughs> don't be got I, I got the Nevada Democratic Party. Yes. Okay. The Nevada Democratic Party is in turmoil two years after supporters of Senator Bernie Sanders took over the machine built by Senator Harry Reid, with both factions fighting each other and even Sanders himself reportedly expressing disappointment with the new leadership. That's a good summary. Thank you, John. Uh my take on this is this is worrisome. We had Jackie Rosen up in 2024, U.S. Senator from Nevada. It's a tough state. Mm-hmm. She needs an organization backing her. We don't know all the context, but it did make me worry if Bernie Sanders is frustrated with the current party chair. Uh, this is an especially big deal in Nevada where the Harry Reid political machine has been critical to winning elections for decades and, ima- and manages to deliver uh, years after his death somehow. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, this is uh, this sucks. He, he delivers years after his death, and, and some of the voters he delivers are years after his, their deaths. <laughs> Coming to a conspiracy near you. John? <laughs> All right, I'll go. Go there for it. Go. Let's see what we got. Let's see what we got. Cocaine Bear. They're not a sponsor. I don't know how that's possible. Yeah. Fox News, Dominion, and the Move On ad. Fox News host Howard Kurtz told his audience on Sunday that the network is not allowing him to cover Dominion's $1.8 billion defamation lawsuit against Fox. The network is also refusing to run a moveon.org ad that highlights text messages that prove Fox hosts lied to their audience about the 2020 election. Here's my take. That's just good business sense. <laughs> you can't have people going on. They're being sued for a billion dollars. The whole business is at stake. You can't have people spouting off about this. Everybody shut the fuck up. Haven't we? Look at what talking did to us. Everybody on this network, we are not talking about this until the suit is done. That just makes sense to me. Yeah, is that Howard, the wrong take? But no, that's a great take. Uh, Rupert Mur- Murdoch, by the way, uh, there's just this was news broke right before we yeah. started recording. Uh, said in his deposition that um, he basically admitted that all the hosts um, were lying. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. then he should have he should have prevented it. Yeah, it seems not great. I just want to add that Howard Kurtz is full of shit, and it didn't take a lawsuit to know that there were a bunch of liars on their air. And as a media critic, you could have chimed in any time. But sure, Howard. Oh yeah, like the 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 sure yeah, he's, yeah, uh, the people's ombudsman from fucking hell. <laughs> Give me a break. Well, I'm trying to bring the truth to the people at Fox News this time. But also, Tommy and I talked about this on our bonus episode about the the Dominion lawsuit. Like this just goes to show how fucking petrified Fox News is about their audience finding out the truth of what happened. It, they know that if a bunch... And some of you would be like, oh, their audience isn't going to care. But then Fox would not be going to such great lengths to prevent them from knowing anything about I, this case. I, I don't think stifling yeah. Howie Kurtz is great length. You tell that <laughs> yeah. paid hack to well, shut up for 15 well, minutes. Yeah, it does the remind Mubana, me of... The Howie Kurtz thing. Do you they remember... Know, um, they what, was know. The, what was the name of that person who, tried to, who, who worked for the NRA and lit the New York Times on fire? Dana Loesch. Yeah. Mm. Uh, 
if you were, if, if you called Dana Loesch the most heinous right wing figure, fascist, all that stuff, didn't care, loved it, ate it up. But if you said you were a grifter Quit. out for the money, yep. mm-hmm. that's what would that was yeah, what I where you would get the response. Get so mad at me. Yep. Yeah, that was nice. it. Would always work. Yeah, good for you. you got her. That's because you got, uh, yeah, I got, you got her. The, the, where is she now? We I don't hear from her. Do we? Yeah. <laughs> Lighting right. light papers on fire at home. Anyway, again, if you go in on Fox News and you're not some Trump supporter, talk about bring the up the lawsuit. Bring up the lawsuit. Bring up the lawsuit. Bring up the lawsuit. Come on. Whoever's the new Juan Williams. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's going on over there. All right. Oh God, I got Marianne Williamson. All right. Uh, self-help author Marianne Williamson. Announced this weekend that she will run for president in 2024. Williamson is the first Democratic candidate to challenge President Biden. Hey, everyone, let's just ignore this story. Uh, yeah. Marion Williamson yeah. dropped out before the first votes were cast in uh, 2020 and, um, you know, just made it to the debate stage, had a few very memeable quotes. I had to do a lot of prep to actually interview her during the primary. Did that ha- happen? Yeah, I oh, interviewed. Yeah, no, I interviewed Forgot. her. Forgot. Yeah, she sent me one of her books. Oh, cool. Signed a couple, couple signed copies of her books. And uh, yeah, I don't think anyone should be worrying about this. There will be no debates this time. There will for be no a moment that. Yeah, no, everyone, everyone hacked the system and figured out. Oh, you just run for president. You got a lot of press. She's going to yeah. try to do it twice. We don't have to let her. Yeah, it's like, well, yeah, we just, you, you did it last time. You didn't even you didn't even make it to the to Iowa. You didn't get out of single digits in in any of the polls, and you didn't make it to any of the votes. So why should you do it this time? Well, Saturn's in a different part of the sky now. <laughs> That's right. You know, okay. I have no idea. All right, Tommy. All right, bear down. Come on, baby. Give me what I want. <laughs> what is he want? Weird. <laughs> DJ Donald Trump. Uh, okay. That's a good one. So, page six reported that Donald Trump is officially DJing every Thursday night at Mar a Lago. And I just wanted to say that my take on this is that it is fake news. Uh, Donald Trump is not on the ones and twos, he's not scratching records. This man is playing with his iPad <laughs> and queuing up Celine Dion while he eats dinner. This is just an old guy ruining dinner, and this is not DJing fake news. Ruining dinner, wrong. He also likes Broadway tunes, it says. It's yeah. not just Celine Dion. Yeah, yeah. And he it's not just cats. any Celine Dion. It's specifically um, uh, My Heart Will Go On. It's, the, it's Really? The, yeah, that Titanic <laughs> banger. Titanic he just one. keeps... Imagine he's just sitting at the table and everyone's just like having a nice time and he's just... That's like a dinner from hell. It, it sounds very, very Trump to me because it's like he's it's too lazy to get up on stage. The, the, mm-hmm. the only part... It, it, yeah, he's telling. got to be telling somebody else to just yeah, play Celine Dion. I don't even know if he knows how to he's work not an, touching iPad. an iPad. He doesn't, he's not touching an iPad. Uh, Greg Craig electing the VP. <laughs> oh, okay. Got it. Okay. Uh, okay, love let's it. Let's poke the bear. <laughs> uh, where is it? Where? Let's see. Um, oh, yeah. In a new essay in the New York Times, former Obama White House counsel Greg Craig says because of President Biden's age and the greater chance he could pass away in office, he should let Democratic delegates pick his VP if he runs for re-election. I'm going to be honest. All right, K-Hive. Listen up. It's his love at stick. I clip this. <laughs> yeah, I can hear the I can hear the buzzing of the K-Hive <laughs> even as I get close to this op-ed. I approached this op-ed with such incredible skepticism. It reminds me, it, I thought it was going to be in the category of America needs a purple party or yeah, like, yeah, no. why can't, why won't Joe Biden choose John McCain and his running mate? I thought it was going to be that kind of a thing. Um, but as I read it, what I found to be interesting about it is it does try to solve this unsolvable problem, which on the one hand, the only argument that really people feel is, is the, the strongest argument against Joe Biden is one of age while kind of recognizing that he's been so successful as a president and done as well with the hand he was dealt as any person could, um, while at the same time being worried that he's not going to fulfill the promise that he made, which is passing the torch uh, to a new generation of leaders. And this is an idea that says, let's have an exciting campaign for who his VP will be. Obviously, uh, that is um, tough for the person who is currently the VP to read, I assume. I assume it wasn't great to have that next to the morning coffee. Yeah. Uh, but the article I Greg, says... I wonder if Greg could get a call. Well, I will say, but people are being unfair because the article says it's not a bad thing for Kamala Harris. That's the article says. Well, the article also argues that that Biden... Because basically the article says that this has happened once. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt did this in 1944. Never heard of him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, uh, Adlai Stevenson did something like this. Not familiar. Uh, yeah, well, that, that turned out great. Yep. Uh, but it, Biden could say, "I prefer Kamala Harris. I want my. I want you to pick my 
current yeah. vice president. It's so a difference between her, but... it's a difference between giving someone a Kamala Harris gift card and giving someone a hundred dollars and say, "Check out Vice President Kamala Harris." <laughs> I want to. You know I, mean? I just want to note that uh, pundit sprinted <laughs> to me for comfort as soon as you said the word K Hive. Now I want to give Greg credit for drafting an op-ed that uh, managed to infuriate both the president's office and the vice president's <laughs> yeah, office that's equally. That's a rare, really feat. hard to do. Good for you. It's also the first original idea I've heard in a while. Yeah. So again, credit to him. The more I thought about it, though, the more I thought at the end of the day, I don't know that this solves the problem that it's claiming to solve, which is assuaging concerns about Biden's age, because you sort of just highlight the concern about the age for, for months and months and months. No, and months. it is a problem. Um, I'm not saying I'm persuaded. Can I highlight one other problem? Sure. Is, Please. Um, let the people decide. The people or the DNC delegates. Right. Well, well, one Biden make it to have a primary, to I have mean, something like we, a primary. Do we want to entrust the future of the president with the DNC delegates? Joe Biden could just Twitter poll this thing like uh, Elon. You yeah, know? right. <laughs> I think the key thing, if you're worried about Joe Biden's age, is we keep sending him on more and more scary international trips and hope God is not paying attention until like 2029. <laughs> he crushed that international trip. That he trip, absolutely yeah. did. It's a long train ride. Just want to say that. Just want to say that. All right. Uh, was that you? That, oh, yeah. You. Yeah, that was me. Here I go. What am I going to get? Getting down there. Joe Manchin on Maria Bartiromo. Okay, here we go. (laughs) On Sunday, Senator Joe Manchin appeared on Fox News with Maria Bartiromo and declined to describe himself as a Democrat. Manchin said, I identify as an American. I'm an American through and through. He's transitioned. (laughs) Manchin also refused to say whether he'll run for re-election in 2024. Okay, here's my take on this. I, I, I want to. Let's hear it. I want to get up. Okay, I'm with Joe Manchin on this one. <laughs> I actually, honestly, that was what I thought I was going to say. Okay, yeah. because here's why. So first of all, uh, I was worried. So Manchin has ruled out running for governor in West Virginia again, and he's ruled out running for president. Remember, we thought he was flirting with that. So it's basically either he's going to run for re-election as senator, or he's going to retire. Right? If Joe Manchin runs for re-election in West Virginia, and he thinks calling himself an independent and leaving the party is the best way for him to get elected. And he is the guy who, you know, voted for Katanji Brown Jackson, all of uh, Joe Biden's judges, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the Joe Manchin Inflation Reduction Act. It's the biggest mm-hmm. investment in climate. The guy who voted for all those things. If it's either him or some fucking Republican, which is basically every other scenario here, a Republican is going to win in West Virginia. A right wing one. A right wing one. If Joe Biden, if, if Joe Manchin doesn't run, um, I don't see another Democrat winning that race, and so therefore we lose a seat. So if Joe if Joe Manchin thinks the best chance he has at winning is calling himself an independent, I don't care what the fuck he calls himself. I, I really don't. I agree with that. Do we think Greg Craig um, is still upset that Kamala Harris hit his dog with her car? <laughs> I mean, just think about all the work that went into that op-ed it to make them so. Op-ed. It's really it's like detailed. A thousand words. Really, th- it's so thoughtful and specific about an idea that has like, like a chin, like, I was like one in a thousand chance of happening. How did Kamala Harris wrong Greg Craig? Yeah, when what did, did she happen? do? Yeah. I, I will say it was annoying that look Joe Manchin's annoying. It was annoying to go on Maria Bartiromo's show right after we learned that she was you know just platforming Sidney Powell and all these election liars. Um, but yeah, no one has to like Joe Manchin. All that all that matters for him are his politics. Uh, his polling numbers go up in West Virginia when he attacks the Democratic Party and Joe Biden. That's why he is currently picking a fight with the Biden administration about implementing the electric vehicle tax credit that his staff wrote into law. Right. He's manufacturing fights wherever he can to create some space. Have at it, bud. Again, just want your vote, man. He, look, just want your vote. Joe Manchin. Don't care about your lifestyle. Don't care about the crazy lifestyle. shit you say. Lifestyle. Don't lifestyle. Care. Houseboat don't, Weekly. Houseboat. Houseboat Weekly. Don't care about the weird shows you go on with the liars. Some of America's most progressive champions are Houseboat Americans. Just just come into the Senate and well, cast pa- your vote. He passed the IRA. He passed the Inflation Reduction Act. He voted for the judges. But you that's know? what I'm saying. A lot of people said that couldn't happen. And it did. Uh, maybe maybe some people on this program. Not not familiar. This one's for you. I'm just going to do this oh. so we can flip it over. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I got. Oh, wait. We, we, we could probably. Do you want to just stop and. Because only. I got the lab leak and I want to do yeah, the yeah, lab leak. Yeah, he's been waiting for a lab leak. I got the lab leak. I want. Do the lab leak. Do the Here's lab the deal. Leak. You guys remember COVID, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, unresolved debate about its origins. There, one theory is uh, it jumped from infected animals to humans naturally, most likely at a market in Wuhan. Uh, two is that COVID spread because of mistake at a laboratory that was doing coronavirus research. So over the weekend, the Wall Street Journal ran a story with the headline, quote, lab leak, most likely origin of COVID-19 pandemic energy department says. Wow. Explosion on Suck Twitter. It, libs. Re- <laughs> Retweets, <laughs> faves, libs. For go, some go, reason, go I arrest, told, arrest people Fauci. People arrest be like, I now. told you the vaccine doesn't work. How did you get there? <laughs> 
<laughs> so here's some context I want everyone to know. First, I'm sure people are wondering, what does the Department of Energy have to do with any of this? Great question. I had that question. The Energy Department oversees the national laboratories. They do biological research. And the Department of Energy updated their assessment based on some new information that came to them in these labs. It's part of this classified assessment. But here's the key context. Uh, energy, the Department of Energy was undecided on the origin of COVID before. Now they believe with low confidence that it came from a lab leak. Now, the low confidence, those words are very important because after Iraq and the WMD fiasco, the intelligence community started saying how strongly they feel about an assessment. So low confidence, shocker, is the lowest you can get. So while the lab leak proponents think, aha, case closed, libs have been owned, here's what you need to know. Two agencies now believe COVID came from a lab leak, the Department of Energy with low confidence, the FBI with moderate confidence. The National Intelligence Council and four agencies disagree. They assess with low confidence that COVID came from natural transmission from an infected animal. Two agencies, including the CIA, so the people charged with spying on the Chinese government, they're undecided, and no one believes that this was some sort of Chinese biological weapons research run amok. I mean, that, that is actually a very popular take on the right. So the bottom line is, we don't really know. It's still undecided. The government is split. In fact, they still lean uh, in favor of natural transmission. So I think hopefully the DNI is going to release some sort of unclassified assessment of this. One question for you. Why are you going to such great lengths to defend the Chinese government? I don't know. Yeah, what's going on? What's going on with Tommy? Let's check Did the... you send the balloon? <sighs> yeah, did you? Hey, Tommy, talk... where, were, where were you when that balloon was in the air? Were you, where were, were you on the floor with a kind of remote, some kind of a, what do are those you, things called? Uh, do you guys know that uh, uh, tonight, Tuesday night, the Republicans are holding their first oversight hearing uh, on China in prime time? Well, and what a coincidence that this leaked the weekend before, I was going to huh? say, I'm sure yeah. this will come up. Yeah, shocker. I, I don't understand. It's like... Let's say it did come from the lab. That doesn't prove a lot of people wrong. It proves like five Twitter people wrong. It, I don't know. It's, it's I don't like, like no one. No one except if, like I guess certain people got over their skis a little bit and were like, "Well, if no, you th- say it's from a lab." Tech you're... platforms were shutting down uh, allegations that it was a lab leak as disinformation, and I think that was clearly an probably shouldn't have done that. Yeah, right? they shouldn't have done that. I don't know why I'm why am I why am I in trouble? I don't know. <laughs> I was always like, seems like it could be seems like it could be random bats. Seems like that lab is pretty close to where this started. Raises some questions. Okay. I never stopped thinking yeah. that. We don't know. Time for the Fauci perp walk. All right. When we come back, uh, Lovett talks to Maddie Hassan about his brand new book, Win Every Argument. I co-wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Pod Save America is brought to you by Fume. Be smart. Don't start. Kick the habit. Put it out before it puts you out. All phrases we've heard a hundred times, yet we still continue to have bad habits. You guys have bad habits, right? Lots of them. Mm-hmm. Okay. Ooh. I don't know what that means. That song. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? Jordan, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, Jordan got it. Our sponsor, Fume, is on a mission to accelerate humanity's breakup from the bad habits that consume far too many of us. Fume is a natural diffusive device that uses plants and behavioral science to help you trade out your negative habit for a positive one. Fume is not a vape. It's a non-electronic device designed to transform your negative habits. Instead of pods filled with potentially harmful chemicals like a vape, Fume uses cores infused with plants like peppermint and cinnamon for delicious natural flavors. Fume's new version 2 model is snappy and tactile. With an adjustable airflow dial and a magnetic end cap, your fingers will always have something to do. Isn't that true? Love it. Yeah, I'm always trying to figure out what I should do with my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> These things look great. They taste great. Mm -hmm. Love it was just trying one the other day. I did. Right here in the office. I did try it. The easiest way to stop a bad habit is to switch to a positive one, and Fume is designed perfectly to do just that. It's Fume's goal to make switching easy and even enjoyable. They have thousands of five-star reviews from people just like you who've successfully switched when other solutions just didn't work. Head to tryfume.com and use code PSA to save 10% off when you get the journey pack today. The Journey Pack comes with three unique flavors and the new version 2 Fume to help kickstart your positive habits. That's tryfum.com and use code PSA to save an additional 10% off on your order today. Pod Save America is brought to you by Lomi. I take out a lot of garbage, waste a lot of food. I don't like it. So you know what happened? What, what did you do? I got a Lomi. What did that do for you? It allowed me to turn all my food scraps into dirt with the push of a button. It's a countertop electric composter that turns scraps to dirt in under Four hours. I said, I don't want like five hours. I don't want six hours. I want it under four hours. I need this dirt now. Don't make me wait for my dirt. Need dirt now. There's no smell. No, no smell, smell when it runs. No and it's smell. also really quiet. No noise, no smell. Just you, your Lomi, and pretty soon, a bunch of dirt. Have you used it on your enemies? Yeah. They're all dirt in my back. They're all okay. sprinkled around. Yeah. They're, they're helping my plants grow. There you yeah. go. <laughs> That's exactly right. You're throwing away too much food. 
It smells sitting there in your garbage. This way, you just you, you turn it into dirt, and you're you're helping the planet, and uh, you know you're, you're getting rid of less food. It's important if you want to start making a positive environmental impact, or just make cleanup after dinner that much easier. Lomi's perfect for you. Head to lomi.com slash crooked and use the promo code crooked to get fifty dollars off your Lomi. That's fifty dollars off when you head to Lomi, L O M I dot com slash crooked and use promo code crooked at checkout. Food waste is gross. Let Lomi save you a cold trip out to the garbage can. Pot Save America is brought to you by Helix Sleep. Helix Sleep is a premium mattress brand that provides tailored mattresses based on your unique sleep preferences. The Helix lineup includes 14 unique mattresses, including a collection of luxury models, a mattress for big and tall sleepers, and even a mattress made just for kids. So how will you know which Helix mattress works best for you and your body? Take the Helix Sleep quiz and find your perfect mattress in under two minutes. Two minutes. Who doesn't have two minutes? And your personalized mattress is shipped straight to your door free of charge. Helix has models with memory foam layers to provide optimal pressure relief if you sleep on your side. Models with a more responsive foam to cradle your body for essential support in stomach and back sleeping positions. Plus, enhanced cooling features to keep you from overheating at night. And if your spine needs some extra TLC, they gotcha. Every Helix mattress has a hybrid design combining individually wrapped steel coils in the base with premium foam layers on top. It's the perfect combination of comfort and support. Love it took the Helix Sleep Quiz. How'd you do, Love It? I passed. Flying colors. Dawn Lux. Mm-hmm. Firm mattress. Mm-hmm. Very, very nice. Very comfortable. Sleep like a baby. Bet it was an upgrade from your old mattress. It was. My old mattress was a piece of sh- Piece of sh- <laughs> Don't want to take our word for it. Helix has been awarded the number one mattress pick by GQ and Wired Magazine. It's even recommended by multiple leading chiropractors and doctors of sleep medicine as a go-to solution for improving your sleep. Helix is offering up to 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash crooked. This is their best offer yet, and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Pods of America is brought to you by Stamps.com. Talk about how fast the year goes by, especially if you're a business owner. Oof, don't we know it. Don't we know it. 2023 is already well underway, so don't wait any longer to level up your small business and set your year up for success. Get ahead of the competition by using Stamps.com to mail and ship. Stamps.com lets you print your own postage and shipping labels right from your home or office. Stamps.com has postage rates you literally can't find anywhere else, like up to 84% off USPS and UPS. For 25 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. And if you sell products online, Stamps.com seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping cart. Use Stamps.com to print postage wherever you do business. That's why we've used Stamps.com since our early days here at Crooked Media. Set your business up for success when you get started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code CROOKED for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code CROOKED. Joining us now, he is the host of The Mehdi Hassan Show and author of the new book, Win Every Argument, The Art of Debating, Persuading, and Public Speaking. Mehdi, our first debate topic, is it great to have you? It is great to have me. Why would it not be great to have me? You put me on my heels. Uh, you start the book with a kind of platonic ideal. A ship is standing by in the harbor with a letter. If the ship is dispatched, people live. If not, people die. Two interlocutors face off in Athens before an audience. The audience votes and decides who will live and who will die. It's, but we're not in Athens anymore. And a lot nope. of debates that play out on television, they're less about persuading the audience and more about Uh, entertainment or the acuity of the debater or performing for the side that's already persuaded. How do you find value in the art of debate in that kind of media environment? Uh, It's a great question. I think there is a lot of entertainment. There's a lot of performance uh, that goes on in a lot of what uh, passes for debates on television. I can't speak for other shows or other hosts. Uh, I can only speak for my show, and we try and do really interesting debates on our show uh, in which I either moderate them as a neutral, as neutral as I can be, uh, or debates in which I'm pushing a position. I try and get someone else on who disagrees with me. I hate soggy consensus. It's funny, John, we're speaking on a day in which I have been absolutely trolled all day online. Uh, by right wingers obsessed over the media suppression of the lab leak theory. Uh, and I had to point out to some of these uh, gentle folks that I actually hosted a debate on the lab leak theory between two scientists with different views back in 2021 because I was actually interested. I happen not to believe in the lab leak theory, but I hosted a debate about it. So, you know, this whole idea of, oh, we were suppressed. No, uh, a lot of us have been having debates in good faith. The problem we have, John, that you identify there implicitly is 
there's a lot of bad faith debating going on right now in America, on TV, in our media. And I'm interested in good faith debates, but I don't deny the fact that there are a lot of bad faith folks out there. I interview many of them on my show. <laughs> well, it's interesting, right? I feel like there's two big problems. There's bad faith debating. And then there's, I think, I think when you talk about the lab leak, I think that there's a certain kind of it's a good example because people really talk past one another and they really want to yeah. feel right and they want to seem right. And so this is a, so what you see is a lot of people saying, uh, look, it's now been proven. It was a lab leak. Everyone lied except for me. Everyone was dishonest <laughs> except for me. Anyone yeah. who said anything in the year 2020 is a liar except for me. Yeah. And then you have to step back and say, well, hold on a second. You're you're cherry picking three or four dumb tweets from people who went too far yeah. or got just as far, just w w got too far with the data in the same way you did in the other direction. Uh, how do you how do you enter a debate? Not necessarily people acting in pure bad faith, but people who are so yeah. desperate to prove their rightness, they kind of talk past one another. It's a great question again. So I deal with that in the book in two ways. Number one, it depends what the goal of your debate is. I go into different arguments, debates, discussions whether it's with my spouse, my kids, my employers, my colleagues, people on TV that I'm debating, people I'm ideologically dis, you know, disagreeing with at a public forum. There's different goals. Not everything is the same. I would say two things in relation to your specific question. One is, are you trying to convince the other person or are you trying to convince a third person? I think sometimes we get too lost in trying to debate and convince the other person. I'm often not trying to convince the other person. I, you know, I'm a TV host. Yeah. I have my own audience at home. I want to persuade the neutral, independent-minded uh, audience at home, the, the third party who is weighing the evidence. And some, you know, when I interviewed John Bolton on my show on the Iraq war, I wasn't trying to persuade John Bolton that the Iraq war was wrong. That would be madness. Uh, I was trying to point out to my viewers, years later, here's a person who still doesn't regret that he was wrong about the Iraq war. Um, so sometimes we gear all our arguments in one direction when we really should be focused on the audience. And the opening chapter of my book is about winning an audience over because that is the number one goal. They are the judge and jury. But in terms of your point about, let's say there is no audience, you're sitting down with someone in private or at a doorstep. If you're, you know, I know a lot of politicians listen to your show, John. If you're canvassing at a doorstep, how do you get that one recalcitrant person who's not a bad person, but you know has maybe overloaded on Sean Hannity every night and uh, doesn't quite get what needs to be gotten? And there's another chapter I talk about in the book which is the importance of listening and empathy. And I think that is where, if you really are trying to persuade someone, not just trying to rhetorically beat them down or dunk on them, not that there's anything wrong with that in certain scenarios. But if it's in the case that you're really trying to win someone over who could be won over, if it wasn't for the fact that you're talking past each other, just throwing facts and figures and stats is not gonna work. You're gonna have to find a way to identify with that person. You're gonna have to find a common ground in terms of your feelings, emotions, thoughts, and you know the scientists have a word for this, which is perspective taking. The social science is strong on this, that if you can put yourself in the shoes of another, if you can get them to walk in your shoes, much more likely to find agreement. And I talk about that in the chapter on listening and empathetic listening. People think debating is all about speaking. I wish that were true. It's also about listening, something I'm really bad at. Uh, but I try and talk about in the book the importance of listening. And I give the example of Bill Clinton. The most famous example in American presidential history is at the 1992 town hall, where uh, a woman in the audience in Richmond, Virginia, asked the three candidates, because Ross Perot, yes, uh, decided to force his way onto that stage, and says, how does, the how does the national debt affect you personally? And George Bush Sr. first looks at his watch, because he wants to go home, and then when he answers the question, starts rambling on about interest rates and about his visit to a black church, because the question was black, uh, but doesn't actually answer the question or even hear the question. What does Bill Clinton do? Gets off his stool, walks towards the questioner, looks her in the eye, he says, how does the debt affect you? Immediately, bond domain. We have no idea whether that question was a Democrat, Republican before and who she'd been planning to vote for. But Clinton makes that immediate, instant emotional connection. So there are ways when people are talking past each other, there are methods that I try and outline in the book that can work. Now, are they silver bullets? No, we live in a very polarized, very heated environment. Yeah, you get at something too about whether you're speak, trying to convince someone or trying to convince someone who's listening. And I do think, thank, thankfully, we live in a world where most people aren't cable news hosts. Uh, what what a what a world that would be. Uh, but present uh, company except of, of course, add, please, John, obviously, thanks. it goes without saying. But uh, I think a lot of people have have I think we've all been trained by by social media to be a host, to be yeah. to act like we are kind of uh, uh uh you know using our platform to convince the people who aren't in the debate but are maybe watching the debate. What yeah. are some tips you might have for people who? 
they're not trying to reach an audience. They are at that Thanksgiving dinner and they don't yeah. want to get into an argument with a loved one. They want to plant a seed. Yeah. Right. They just want to, yes. they just want to kind of get, just open the door a little bit. What are, what are some, what have you learned about the best ways to do that? So I mentioned, I talk about empathetic listening in the book and I mentioned that a moment ago, very important to people want to be heard. Uh, that's very important. Did you mention um, listening? I wasn't paying attention. I'm just kidding. That's no, a joke, that's a joke I mean, about, yeah, you're, about you're, listening. That's hilarious. <laughs> and uh, we're sitting around the table at the Thanksgiving table and I talk about that in the book and look, the number one issue, and it might sound obvious to some people, but you'd be amazed how many people don't do it, including members of the Democratic political party at a national and state level, which is appeal to people's hearts, not their heads, right? We think that if we turn up at the Thanksgiving table with 700 different statistics about the border crossings, that will get Uncle Jack or whoever uncle is at the table saying, kick them all out, build the wall. That will win them over to the pro-immigration uh, argument. That's not what will work. In fact, you've got to find other ways of appealing people. And the number, you know, uh, Dale Carnegie said it years ago, decades before I wrote a book on the subject, that we're not dealing with rational creatures when we're dealing with human beings. We're dealing with emotional creatures. So if you want to get through to people, especially family members, especially on uh, contentious issues, you've got to find that emotional bond. You've got to tell a story, a personal story. Make it personal, something that identifies to you and them. Uh, you've got to also be able to kind of show, not tell. You've got to also have some passion. The number of people who present arguments in a kind of dispassionate, robotic way, because we're kind of all rational animals, we think that's the way to convince people. It's not. You've got to have some passion. You've got to have some emotion. You've got to have some energy in order to connect with people, because people make decisions instinctively with their gut, with their heart, not just with their heads. And I've said this for a while. The reason why Democrats often get beaten up when it comes to the messaging game is because Republicans, like it or not, have found a way to rouse the emotions of their base, not in a way I approve of, in a kind of demagogic way, uh, you know, anger, paranoia, resentment, victimhood, uh, fear of the other, but it works. It gets people worked up. Against that, you can't turn up with a 16 point policy paper. We saw that in 2016. Donald Trump very memorably build the wall, ban Muslims, lock her up, stuff that resonated, memorable, emotive, uh, provocative, and Hillary Clinton, bless her, great childcare plans, but not stuff that people are going to turn up in their droves in the crucial places where she needed them to turn up and vote for her. So I, I do think that's been a problem for a long time on the left. And I'm from the UK, as you know, the Labour Party in the UK has had the same problem, often seen as technocratic, bureaucratic, managerial, not enough heart. What do you think are the, um, like, I think there's a challenge that we face that's it's not it's not just a matter of tactics or strategy. Re Republicans compete on hate. They compete on fear. They compete on these very powerful emotions. Uh, what what do you what are some examples or, or who are some politicians that you think are finding an emotional resonance from the left that isn't playing that kind of a game? I mean, uh, the obvious answer would be uh, Bernie Sanders. Uh, Bernie Sanders is out with a book now on capitalism. He's a person who understands that people are angry. And you have to respond to that anger. You have to channel that anger, whatever word you want to use. Populism is a very uh, loaded phrase, but he has a left populism to push back against the right populism. Which is, yes, be angry, but don't be angry at the transgender kid. Don't be angry at the Mexican migrant. Don't be angry at the Muslim under the bed who's going to blow you up, you think. Be angry at the 0.1 percenters who have screwed you over and screwed over your 401ks and screwed over your healthcare system. And I think that is important. I think showing, identifying that anger, you can't pretend that people aren't angry in this country. It's what you do about it. I would also say it's also not just about what you're saying, it's how you're saying it. I mean, I look at, I look, I've said this point many times. I'm just going to say it again. There have been six presidential elections in the 21st century. Democrats have lost three and won three. And the three they lost were Hillary Clinton, Al Gore, and John Kerry. Uh, smart people, many people would say good people, decent human beings who wanted to improve the country would have done had they won, but not exactly the greatest emotional speakers, orators, uh, and you know, great respect to you, John, I know you worked on a couple of those campaigns, but those are people who did not rouse people to get out to the polls. And you look at the people who won, again, someone you did work for, Barack Obama twice, Joe Biden, people who don't sound like they're just throwing talking points at you, don't just sound, despite all the Republican attacks, on Obama, don't just sound like they're reading from a teleprompter. Joe Biden is not a great orator, but when he speaks, it's authentic, or at least it's perceived as authentic. Yeah, it's interesting though. I, I like to, I, I've thought about this, and, and you know, I I, I had a feel. I, I know that I had a feeling you would go to Bernie Sanders, and and I and I hear you on this kind of whatever a, a version of populism, but aimed at the right, the right enemies, the right kind of anger aimed in the right places. Yeah. But if you talk about 
Bill Clinton, you talk about Barack Obama, you talk about Joe Biden. I think one thing that all three have in common is their campaigns very much uh, 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 were not rooted in anger. They tend to be optimistic figures, right? They tend to appeal to people with a more kind of hopeful uh, 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 less combative tenor, right? That's been, I think, a big part of the way which Democrats have won. And so I'm just, I'm actually, I'm, I'm genuinely unsure. Like, is it that Democrats- I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, to... I'm gonna push back. Okay. I'm gonna push back against you. On Barack Obama, for example, you know Obama better than I do, obviously. But I would say, if you go back to 2008, he didn't beat Hillary Clinton just with hope. I think that's slightly rewritten. He was pretty vicious in some of his campaign. You're likable enough. He went after rallies. He went after her with name. And I write a chapter in the book on ad hominem attacks. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with ad hominem attacks. You go after the credibility of your opponent, call them out. Uh, Barack Obama did that. When he went after uh, Mitt Romney, he was vicious in his Bain attacks. He was so vicious in his Bain attacks that Cory Booker came out and tried to disown him uh, because he didn't. we were being too mean to Bain. So I'm not quite sure. I get your point, but I'm not sure that's quite the summary of Barack Obama. I would take. Look, let's move away from Bernie Sanders. My point is not even about left or right. I don't care what you're selling. It's about a style, a yeah. tone of voice, an approach to rhetoric. So let me give you another example. Ruben Gallego is someone running for office now in Arizona. I thought his uh, campaign ad where he launched his campaign was a fantastic ad in terms of, again, channeling some of that anger implicitly, both at Republicans and against Kirsten Cinema. There's a lot of Eric Swalwell. No one would say Eric Swalwell. I don't think Eric Swalwell described himself as a Bernie lefty socialist, but he's someone I often see just swinging punches, rhetorical punches at the Republicans, both on social media and in some of his very nifty ads. I would like to see more of that. Yeah, no, I, and I agree. I'm, I'm actually not, I don't mean it in an ideological sense. I actually just am trying to parse out. There are times where it looks like, hey, the way you take on Trumpism or this kind of right-wing populism is we need to have a kind of populism and ang a, 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 we have a, need to have a righteous fury of, of our own. Yeah. But then there are also, I think, I think, I think generally speaking, I hear you on the points about the various kinds of, I think, tough attacks that people like President Biden and pre uh, President Obama and even uh, President Clinton have made. But for the most part, viewing it as their job to create a kind of a hopeful alternative. Yes. And, and I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm yeah, yeah. saying that, well, first of all, we're living in different times, right? Bill Clinton was not facing the same political environment that a Democrat today is facing or a media environment. So the anger is very different. Um, but yeah, you're right. Of course, you need a hopeful, optimistic message. And I, I talk about that in the very final uh, chapter of the book when I talk about how you bring your argument to a close, the grand finale. Uh, and I give the examples, I give other examples, for example, Winston Churchill, who was seen as someone who inspired people, uh, despite having been a very poor orator himself as a younger man, he used to sit in the bathtub and practice out loud speaking. We remember him as the great World War II uh, rhetorician. He was very poor orator in his 20s and 30s. He had a stutter that he had to fight with. He had a hopeful message. It wasn't just his delivery, it was very unique. But of course, it was an optimistic message, one that we will defy the odds, one that we will be victorious, one that we will uh, you know, see the post-war promised land. And I agree with you. You need some of that, too. You do need to, as a comeback to what we said earlier, you need to rouse people emotionally. Liberals and progressives have to decide which emotions they want to rouse. Um, so, for example, when I, I mentioned immigration, you're arguing with your uncle at the immigration table. Uh, he's, his, the emotions that have been activated in him are, you know, fear and loathing, paranoia. They're coming to replace us. Uh, to borrow a Fox and Nazi phrase. Um, and you need to push back with, actually, we're America. We're so much better than this. This is what this country was built on. This is what many of our own uh, forefathers, maybe members of our family around the table, uh, who are immigrants or children of immigrants. This is about building a common future through new blood and new energy uh, and a common purpose. And I think, you know, that is a message that actually works. And we've seen that in the polling, actually, in terms of some of the immigration numbers have turned around. So uh, you mentioned the media environment, and that would, of course, would be a, you, no no place better than Fox to deliver that kind of paranoia directly to people's brains. President Biden, there was a bit of a kerfuffle around the Super Bowl as to whether or not he would go on a Fox-affiliated yeah. outfit. Uh, putting that specific example aside, where do you fall on this question as to whether or not progressives and Democratic politicians uh, should engage with Fox News? On the one hand, it's legit it legitimizes a propaganda yeah. apparatus. On the other if you don't go, nobody's speaking. And Pete Buttigieg, he kicks yeah. ass when he goes on Fox. So I am of the Elizabeth Warren school that you shouldn't go on Fox. Um, I, I'm not a fan of that. Uh, Bernie Sanders does it. Pete Buttigieg does it. They both do it very well. Uh, no denying that. But I do believe it is a propaganda organization. I refuse to call it Fox News. Uh, we're speaking on a day where you know the latest Rupert Murdoch deposition in the Dominion trial has just uh, been released. 
and gotten out and we're seeing what he said in private versus what he said in public. And it's exactly the same as Sean Hannity, Tucker Carlson, Laura Ingram with their text, which is they say completely the opposite in private. They're not interested in news. I think there's a line from Murdoch that we're not red or blue. We're about green, uh, which I thought was brutally honest in a private email. Um, and I just think, what are you doing going on Fox, legitimizing an organization which pushes white supremacy evening after evening on shows like Tucker Carlson? As someone who is a brown immigrant with brown Muslim kids, I find it personally offensive for anyone who thinks that that is a news operation. And people say, well, there's a big audience. We've got to get the eyeballs. Well, Alex Jones has a big audience. Why not go on InfoWars? Where do you draw the line? Alex Jones has a huge audience, whether we like it or not. Why not go on there? If you want to get to new audiences, why not do the Stormfront website? That's an audience that others can't reach. I mean, I think it's a very slippery slope to go down to say, well, that's where the eyeballs are. Um, I think if you want to win those arguments, you want to win over those voters, do it on the ground, do it the old fashioned way. Try and build up a political machine that can still canvas in left behind areas. Look at the East Palestine debacle. As, as cynical as the right-wing attacks were, as dishonest as Donald Trump's visit was, the reality is he did show up and people did say, hey, you, you know, I, I saw the quotes from uh, people in, uh, in Ohio in that place saying, you came, you didn't forget us. Now, we know that's bullshit. You and I know that's bullshit. Uh, but it's, 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 a re it's a vacuum that's filled on the ground. So there are other ways of reaching conservative voters. I don't believe that helping to prop up uh, this figment of imagination that Fox is a news organization helps. And people say, well, even if you don't go on, that doesn't affect them. Actually, it does. Fox is obsessed with trying to get legitimacy and mainstream credibility. And I think you see that in the White House briefing room. I think you see that in their advertising. I think you see that in their guest selection. You've recently had a bit of a revelation. You were very critical of President Biden when he was a candidate. Uh, uh, but you've apparently, you've seen the neolib light. All right. You gave an interview where you said, uh, and this is exact quote, the most impressive president in your lifetime. He is virile and extremely charismatic in a sexual way. Uh, <laughs> now, <laughs> exact quote was that that, wow, that wow. I, most of that's an exact quote. All right. I have, the, a, chapter, I have a chapter on receipts in my okay. book and you didn't bring any receipts. You did. That. You did say most impressive president in your lifetime. Uh, now you have this, you have a president who has exceeded expectations in virtually every way except yes. one, which is yes. that he has continued to get older. If the, de yes. if the debate over Biden and whether or not he should run again, whether or not he should win again, redounds to this question of age as a, as our debate expert, what is the best way for Democrats to win that argument? It's a great question. Let me just say, if we were in a debate and I was trying to beat you up, uh, which I'm not, of course, I would say that you only read part of the quote, even your made up quote ended too early because I did go on to say he is the most impressive president of my lifetime. It's a very low bar given George W. Bush, yes. Donald Trump, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but even compared to the Democrat, Democratic gods, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, I think Joe Biden has definitely achieved more legislatively. And even what you just mentioned a moment ago, refusing to go on Fox. I mean, I don't think Barack Obama would have the guts to do that. Uh, but Joe Biden did that. So look, I give him plaudits. That doesn't mean I'm a kind of uh, fanboy. I think his immigration stuff has been awful. I think he's uh, dropped the ball on COVID in recent months. Uh, there's many, Israel, Palestine, he's as horrific as every previous president. So I've got a lot of criticism still, but you know, he's clearly made the case uh, to be the Democratic candidate again. Yes, you're right. There's no doubt that age is the biggest problem with him. Uh, what do you do about age? What is the argument you make for age? I think the argument, if I was him, and I'm not saying I support this argument, but if you had to make the argument for age, I would just plaster my visit to Ukraine over every campaign ad and every answer. I would say, all right, yes, uh, I'm old. Uh, but Mr. Interviewer, would you like to get on a 10 hour train journey and a secret flight and wander around a war zone as the first president in modern American history to do so without American military support uh, in that war zone? I would play the Ukraine card, which was a pretty effective card that he played recently. Seems to be working. Some of his poll numbers look better. But look, age is a real problem. I would also point out Donald Trump will be close to 80 or in his 80s if he were to run, win and serve a second term. Um, uh, Nikki Haley's been playing the age card uh, against Trump and Biden. Not sure how that's working out for her, given Ron DeSantis is younger than her. So I think the age argument only goes so far um, because don't forget, some of us, including myself, and I'll hold my hands up here and concede this. I have a chapter on concessions in the book. I'm going to concede. I was wrong about Biden's age in 2020. I thought he was too old in 2020. I was like, is he all there? Is he sunsetting? Like when he made some of the gaffes and debates about record players, I was one of the people going, oh, uh, is, is this really the guy you want going up? And uh, like I said, he proved me wrong on many issues. So I think if I was him, I would push Ukraine. 
I would push a successful record and I would push, well, Donald Trump will be equally old. I do. And I do everything in threes, as I point out in the book. I'm glad. You, and, and that's and it works. I'm glad you re- referenced how we f- might have felt a little bit in 2020, because I, I'm of two minds of this, too, because it's like, listen, this would be the oldest person to ever be sworn in as president. But at the same time, I, I felt like there was a certain kind of uh, um uh, uh, engaged progressive who was really paying attention, who was put off by stumbles, worried about his age. And then the critics would have such a, a much lower evaluation of Joe Biden's yes. as a debater than the than the typical person so watching. True. And what it, so, <laughs> so I'd actually think of like, how do we <laughs> it's like, how do you how do you put yourselves in the shoes of the kind of person that maybe isn't paying as close enough attention or close as close attention as we would? I actually think we're over focused on that. I think it actually matters who the Republican opponent is. If yeah. he's up against Trump, I think he has a good chance of winning again. Why not? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. If he's up against DeSantis, I do think it'll be tougher. I think if you're up against DeSantis, he's a different type of candidate. Not that I'm one of these people who thinks DeSantis is some great threat. I think he's a deeply overrated politician with a glass jaw. But DeSantis can, will have advantages that Trump doesn't have and will be able to play the youth. Uh, against kind of uh, old age card. And don't forget, I talk about this in the book, you've always got the Ronald Reagan card. I mean, Reagan was the person who dealt with this the most successful, memorable way in American history. In a debate, when it was the question was thrown at him about his age, he made fun of Walter Mondale and said, I won't use his youth and inexperience against him. It was a great zinger. I include it in the book, in the chapter on zingers, as much as I loathe Reagan, I love that line. And I think people have done it before. So I don't necessarily think that Biden's age is going to be the deal breaker. I think it will be a problem. I think it will be a big problem against the Ron DeSantis, not against Donald Trump. But I don't think that's what's going to decide 2024. My worry about 2024 is how strong the fascists are going to be at a local and state level in terms of corrupting our election process and then starting an insurrection after the next election. Let's talk about the fascists for a second. Uh, 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 So we're in the midst of this uh, uh, anti-trans backlash that's being fomented by a bunch of right-wing politicians who are trying to pass anti-trans laws. But one step away from them, you have the J.K. Rowlings of the world who who are offended by the term of, of transphobe while, while kind of pushing misinformation and kind of otherizing trans people. You have com- right-wing comedians uh, who have been, like, even people that wouldn't consider them as conservatives, embracing a kind of conservative aesthetic, your Dave Chappelle's. You have uh, journalistic figures who consider themselves objective, teaching the controversy, uh, 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 wondering if this whole gender thing has gone too far. You have all these different factions making noise, and you have progressives, you have doctors, you have experts, you have trans people trying to take on all these factions at once. On the When do you try to debate to win these arguments on points? Or when do you feel like you have to accept that you're Lucy with the chocolates and the only way to win is not to play, to kind of stop trying to win these point by point arguments with people who don't care about the truth and go for the millions of people who are maybe just starting to understand this issue at all? It's a great question. And it's something I've struggled with for a long time. I am not transgender, but I am Muslim. So I know what it's like to be a minority that's feared and loathed and becomes a political cudgel because for 20 years, uh, that has been the Muslim community since 9-11, certainly. Uh, you saw Donald Trump get elected on the back of a Muslim ban. And the same question was persisting then. Do you debate this stuff? Or do you say my identity, my existence is not up for debate? And I think I would, uh, you know, who am I? I'm not going to speak on behalf of transgender community. But what I would say, as a Muslim person who feels very worried about the hate-filled attacks on a certain community in our midst, the way that they've been turned into political football, my advice would be is, again, to go back to the start of our conversation, separate this out. Are you going to go and debate Matt Walsh on The Daily Wire on transgender kids? No. No, there's just no point to that. And I keep telling interviewers this as I talk about my book. If I wrote the book again, if I wrote a sequel, I would add a chapter that I feel I missed, which is when to walk away from an argument. Right? There's certain people you don't argue with because it's not a good faith argument because they're just trolls or they're just bigots. So yeah, I won't have Marjorie Taylor Greene on my show, even if she wanted to come on and said, I'll give you great viral moments. No, what would be achieved from that? Nothing. She's not a good faith actor. She's a fantasist and a grifter. So who's your, who, what's your goal? You want to go debate Matt Wolf? No, don't debate that, you know, Lucy and the football, as you said. But are there millions of Americans out there who want to understand more about gender affirming care, who want to understand more about whether their kids are going to be disadvantaged in school because of the rules on which gender can play which sports. Yeah, there are millions of Americans who have those concerns, including millions of Democrats, liberals, and self-proclaimed progressives. That's just a fact. This is new stuff for a lot of people. 
So should you be going out there and persuading those people? Should you be engaged in good faith debate? If you can identify good faith people to debate with, yes. And, I, and I, again, to use the Muslim analogy, would I, go on, would I go on a show on Fox to debate the Muslim ban? No. But would I have a good faith discussion with someone on NPR about the terrorist threat from Muslim groups? And do Muslims, are Muslims doing enough to tackle terrorism in their midst? Was a question I was asked 7,000 times post 9-11. Yeah, I did that. I went and did those discussions on the BBC, on CNN, etc. So you've got to separate it out. What is the good faith part of the argument? Who are the convincibles and the persuadables? And who are the bigots and the grifters and the attention seekers? Don't debate with them. Do debate with the others. That's as simply as I can put it from my own perspective as a minority journalist. Yeah, it, uh, there's just a, you know, the old expression, don't don't mud wrestle a pig, you'll get dirty and they'll like it. Uh, they'll, they'll enjoy it, indeed. You, you've given us a lot of your time, but I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't end, end with, with a debate. Uh, can we please put on the screen how a dog would wear pants? Can you choose a side and make an argument and defeat me when yeah. I argue the alternative? Well, you pick your side first, and I'll just pick, I'll argue the other. You I'm go gonna, first. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for the. I'm gonna. Because I say in the book, I say in the book. Sometimes you want to go first. Sometimes you want to go last. I want to go last. Okay, I am going to argue that a dog would wear pants uh, as on the left, as in all four oh, I'm legs. I'm so glad you. Said I know, that. I know. I chose the harder side. <laughs> a ludicrous position. Okay, uh, so would you like me to go first, or would you like? Would I? Yes, should please. I? Okay. No, no, you go. Here's you my go. point. I understand that we live in a world where people confuse aesthetics and morals. I understand why aesthetically someone like Mehdi would assume that a dog would wear pants just on their hind legs. I agree it looks more like the way pants should be worn, but that's not how I approach this problem, all right? I see a dog with four legs, and I believe for a dog to wear pants, all four legs should be in pants. If I was only wearing pants on half my legs, I would look ridiculous, but it is because you think it is more important that a dog look like a person then a dog wear pants the way a dog would wear pants inside of a dog culture, that you've adopted this ridiculous position. I think it's, I, I would just say one thing. This is a show. I mean, you've had more time to think about this argument, but let me just say in the few seconds that I have, that this is a show with liberal listeners. And I think liberals understand that it's deeply offensive to push an argument that is based on a separate but equal approach wow. to life. I Holy think separate shit. but equal is something we put behind us, I think the dog wants to be equal with man. Dog is man's best friend. The idea that you would put dog, you would put a dog in pants mm -hmm. with his owner, but you would not allow the dog to wear pants in the style of his owner. And to say that that apartheid situation wow. is something that I could endorse. Holy shit. You know, I, I believe in equality. Look, values matter here. Also, I, you know what? It's all about values. You know what? I want equality. I, I, got, want I don't want separate but equal, John. If that's what you want to push, if that's what the audience wants to go for, you take separate but equal. The next I'm time I see equal. you, I'm going to make two to points. I'm gonna, next time I see you, I'm going to make two points, one with my left and one with my right. All right? And you'll fail because I say in the book, you have to have three points always. I also held up the, the hands in the wrong Read order. The book, John. I held up the hands in the wrong order. Uh, Mehdi Hassan, thank you so much for your time. The book <laughs> is Win thank Every you, Argument. Uh, the Art of Debating, Persuading, and Public Speaking. Mehdi, uh, I would say that, you know, for our first topic, was it great to have you? I think the answer was yes. I think it was. I think you won that argument, too. I appreciate it, John. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And uh, uh, I won't say that uh, your co-host told me to rhetorically beat you up because that would be true. Wow. Wow. Well, you know what? I, I made it. I survived the debate. I feel okay. You were, fan you were fantastic. Oh, I thoroughly please. enjoyed it. And I, I, it was very clear to me that you read the entire book and ran circles around me. I almost, Thanks yeah, sure. I would almost, I could almost ask you the, uh, the unprepared Charlie Rose question, which is your book. Why now? <laughs> <There's> a, um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, there's a, there's, I do book interviews for a living. Trust me, John, I've been on the other side of this. A number of times <laughs> I'm wondering, are they going to ask me, have I read page 172 it's, of the book? And I'm petrified of that moment. The rudest question you can ask a person is, have you read my book? It's an unacceptable question. Even, I read every I'm word. I'm not even going to ask you. I'm not I read every you. goddamn word. you have because you were so damn good today. Mehdi, thank you so much. This was great. Thanks, John. Pod Save America is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. These days, job seekers want more. Everything from remote working conditions to an easier application process. Sometimes it can be hard to stand out to job seekers. How can you break through the clutter and attract the most qualified candidates for your business? ZipRecruiter. And right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com crooked. There are a bunch of ways ZipRecruiter helps you stand out to the right candidates. 
Their technology sends you great candidates for your job, and you can send a personal invite to your top choices to make an impact. ZipRecruiter also makes it easy for candidates to apply to your job. In fact, they can apply with one click. Plus, ZipRecruiter offers attention-grabbing labels like urgent, training provided, remote, and more that will catch the eye of quality candidates. Get your job noticed by the best and brightest candidates with ZipRecruiter. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See for yourself. Go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash cricket. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash C-R-O-O-K-E-D. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. Pod Save America is brought to you by Smile Actives. Have you ever wished that you had whiter and brighter smile? Well, before you visit a dentist, you should know that their whitening treatments can be very expensive. And it's not just the price. You also have to book the appointment and schedule time away from work or family to sit in a dentist's office chair while undergoing the procedure. It's a hassle. Fortunately, now you can try Smile Actives at home or anywhere, anytime. Smile Actives offers a safe and affordable alternative to those expensive whitening procedures. Smile Actives is the whitening boost your favorite toothpaste needs to give you the smile you deserve. Simply add Smile Actives Pro Whitening Gel to your regular toothpaste. It's been formulated with the PolyClean technology to boost stain removal and deliver active whitening ingredients into teeth, grooves, and crannies to get better whitening. 97% of Smile Active's users in a clinical trial reported up to six shades whiter on average all within 30 days. We love Smile Active here. I use it every day. You just squirt a little bit on your toothbrush along with your toothpaste, and that's all. That's all you it's have to think that about. easy. Visit smileactives.com slash cricket today to receive our special buy one, get one free offer. What is it, love it? It's a bogo. With auto delivery and free shipping and handling, that's smileactives.com slash cricket. Terms and conditions apply. See site for details. Pods of America is brought to you by Policy Genius. Talk about in your own words why it's important to get life insurance. I hate to break it to you guys, but we're all going to die. Yeah, with that attitude. <laughs> I mean, that's it. That is why you need to get life insurance. You want to leave your family holding the bag for... Uh... Costs. Costs. Policy Genius gives you a smarter way to find and buy life insurance so you can future proof your family's finances. Policy Genius was built to modernize the life insurance industry. With their technology, you can easily compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers to find your lowest price. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $39 per month for $2 million of coverage. Some options offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. I'm going to leave everything to pundit. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. She heard that. She's accustomed to a lifestyle. Policy Genius's licensed agents can help you find the best fit for your needs. They work for you, not the insurance companies. They're not incentivized to recommend one insurer over another so you can trust their guidance. There are no added fees and your personal info is private. No wonder they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net. You deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. Head to policygenius.com or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com. Before we go, we've got some important legal wrangling to attend to. Love it. Since you have the best legal credentials here with your impressive LSAT score. Did you write this, Tom? <laughs> Didn't. Fuck, why am I reading this? <laughs> uh, we're going to let you take us through it. Go ahead. Uh, last week, Marjorie Taylor Greene tweeted, we need a national divorce. We need to separate by red states and blue states and shrink the federal government. Everyone I talk to says this. From the sick and disgusting woke culture issues shoved down our throats to the Democrats' traitorous America last policies, we are done. We can all agree that the left will gladly keep disgusting woke culture in the divorce, but what about everything else? John, Tommy, and I have decided we are going to take the amicable route and fairly split things up with Marjorie Taylor Greene. There's no need to get a judge or submarine involved. We can settle this ourselves. I'll run through a list of items, and our job will be to find a way to amicably split them uh, so that we can have a we can we can settle this without going without a kind of joint long custody? and acrimonious yeah sure, joint custody. Sure, sure. All right, so I think we're going to use that whiteboard. Okay. Oh my gosh, there's a whiteboard involved. Yeah. Katie Porter. Well, we've now um, set up a whiteboard. So here we go. <laughs> Here's how it works. Uh, we are trying to amicably split. So mm -hmm. I'm going to yeah, give yeah. us things to split up, and we will, obviously we want to do well for ourselves as blue Americans, but we also are trying to be fair. Okay. okay. So are we are we playing as blue Americans or are we playing as sort of our like uh like our fair people? The yeah, like judges. Um I think we're um we're like the mainstream media. We're from the cities, but we're trying to pretend we're fair. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> You know? Good. Yeah, that's, that's good. good. That's yeah. Good answer. Keep that in. Great answer. Okay. All right, here we go. Perfect. Uh first up, we have the Chris's. Chris Pine, Chris Evans, Chris Hemsworth, Chris Pratt. Uh-huh. Um I think we obviously give them Chris Pratt. Yeah, they get Pratt. They get Pratt. That's an easy one. Um, uh, 
I want Evans. I just, I, it's important to me that we get Evans. Okay. Okay. Um, so now we've got Chris Prine and we've got Chris Hemsworth. I don't have a strong opinion. I think between we those two want Chris Hemsworth. Here. You think we want Hemsworth? Okay. Yeah. I think that's right. I think that's giving them a great Chris too. Yeah. Hemsworth. And they're going to get Pine. Can we give them Army Hammer? He just feels like he sure. goes in this bucket and, and would Army. fit in over there. Oh, I spelled Army wrong. Yes, yeah, it's I, okay. I don't know he how. Doesn't, he can't afford a lawyer Army anymore. Army Hammer. Good. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, Chili's Friday's Buca de Beppo and Cheesecake Factory. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, mm-hmm. <laughs> I, have a, I have a pitch. Okay. okay. Which is, I will do anything to keep Cheesecake Factory. I was going to. I'm with you. Okay. So, I would I like would us not, to. I would not. I, I like chilies. How is the Outback Steakhouse not in that list? And okay, we can, can want we Outback. Yeah, How about I... this? I think we should give them Chili's Fridays and Buca de Beppo, because in a lot of a lot of these uh, red states, that's will be the best Italian food they can get. <laughs> um, and then we get we get Outback and we get cheesecake. Yeah, the only oh, problem is is that like Chili's, Chili's and TJ Fridays both have the best honey mustard of any chain restaurant. You were the most it's... basic motherfucker I've ever. I had. know. I, I'm a I'm a Stounding. I'm a purple American, Tommy. <laughs> oh Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I so want an innovation. Party. He worships. He worships an awesome god in the blue states. <laughs> an All awesome right, blossom. you know what? Fine. They get Fridays. Oh yeah. Okay. Ch- we'll I'm get happy. chilies. Yes. I'm happy. I don't with know. This. You I don't want chilies. Buka, buka de Beppo. They can have Whatever. buka. Fine. They can have buka. Take it. Um, I do think, and we're gonna get like Outback. Out yeah. Okay. yeah. But I do think because we're getting Cheesecake Factory, I'm just gonna throw in Panera Bread. <laughs> I think that's fair. It and sucks. that's right. Because it fucking sucks. Yeah. We're gonna get the Olive Garden. Sure. That's our Italian. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get Olive Garden. Unlimited bread. Because if because they don't want anywhere where your family. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. White Lotus and Yellowstone. I feel like this is a bit of a gimme. Uh, yeah, a gimme. what was it's that? Come on. Well, I just wanted an easy one. And white. Everyone Lotus. wins on that one. Yeah. yeah, that's great. They don't they don't watch White Lotus. Um McDonald's and Taco Bell. McDonald's and Taco Bell. Um I think. I think they should. Pro- mm. They're gonna. T- they're gonna demand McDonald's. Yeah, they don't want Taco Bell. It was fed at state dinners. Yeah. It's a. Uh, it's a win for them, but I'm gonna. I'm gonna agree. Yeah, I'm not happy about it. Um, I'm gonna say we get Taco Bell. If they got Taco Bell, they would make racist. Can we get like the it? Yum brand triumvirate? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I think that's right. We can get the Pizza Hut, and we can get. Ah, uh, you know what though? They gotta get the KFC. Ugh, bummer. They gotta get the KFC. They get the KFC. Well, we're gonna get Popeyes. Okay. Okay. We're gonna get Popeyes. We're gonna get Popeyes. We're gonna get Popeyes. That you know, that's what else we got. That's Louisiana done right. That's an old white guy with a mustache. All right. (laughs) Uh, So it checks out. Uh, The feeling of having no emails in your inbox versus the feeling of having a fully charged cell phone and a dog that has peed and pooped. Oh, that's that's interesting. Okay. Uh, (laughs) We'll never get to feel one of those again. I'm. I will never again have a fully out um, inbox. Yeah, I will never delete all my emails or read them all. So they get in the inbox. We well, need the, the dog. The, the, yeah, yeah, dog they're gonna get phone. inbox. Zero. Also, my phone. I'm not phone gonna charge my phone. Through the uh, roof. Phone. Have you heard about this podcast offline? Poop, charged, etc. That didn't make sense, but you get the gist. Yep. Uh, all right, this is gonna be a tough one. And I deputize you as being able to discuss this. Uh oh, this seems it's gonna get us into trouble. Well. LGBT. <laughs> um, we're we're just we're just gonna try to figure out. We have that's a divorce. It sucks. Nobody went. That's why divorce is so horrible. People end up in places they don't want to be. And I have a I have, have a to split it evenly. No, no, there's, there's too many. There's five no, letters. no, they're not these. No, I'm. Here's my proposal. Okay. They're can't just wait, gonna I get. To argue with they're this getting vigorously. the le, they're getting the lesbians, <laughs> and we're getting everything <laughs> else. Q I A two spirits, etc. Um, uh, this is because of trucks and oh living God. in South. So don't. That's the choice they made. Pass. That's the choice they made. I'm getting a thumbs down from an L on the couch. <laughs> I'm getting an L from. <laughs> I'm getting a big, getting a big thumbs down. Please direct all comments. <laughs> all right um that was a tough one all right message box playbook and punch bowl <laughs> <laughs> we obviously get message box yeah we gotta Dan get, would not wonder what to do there we yeah. gotta get we gotta get message box play playbook you them reading message box red says get playbook they, they can have playbook they already have it they can have playbook 
We get we get punch ball. We're taking punch ball. Yeah. Substantive. We're taking punch ball. I mean, punch ball is like the Kevin McCarthy mouthpiece of choice. So I don't know. If... Yeah, but at least they. they yeah, but them. well, I like what he's wonky. thinking. Yeah. Okay. That's All good. right. Uh. 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 And fi- um, let's see. Let's do um. Uh, the Great Lakes and the Grand Canyon. Mm. Mm. I mean, I feel like there's more value to having the Great Lakes. Oh, yeah. Water just, shortages. Than just like a Colorado and stuff. Big thing that people stare in. All right. So we're going to take the Great Lakes. <laughs> is that what that is? <laughs> there's five of them, right? Sure. Yeah. That's is that fun. right? <clears throat> Which one's yeah, Huron? Great Lakes. Huron, Superior, Ontario, Erie. That, that's Michigan. vaguely what they look like. Wow. Yeah, Damn. right? And Good then they're going to go to the Grand Canyon. Draw that. <laughs> <laughs> Very well done. Wow. Um, all right. I uh, feel pretty good about what we have. Yeah, I think we did a good job. I think, let's see. Let's see. How do we do? The Red State's got We're, Chris Pratt, Chris Pine, Army who gets, Hammer. Who gets the awesome god? Um, mm, well, we do worship an awesome god in <laughs> the Blue States. That's right. Um, yeah. You know, so I think that we'll get... We'll, I think we need to throw this over to the Ben Shapiro show and see if he thinks it's fair. Yeah, that's fair. Buka de Beppo, they get Panera Bread. They get Yellowstone. They love that. They do get McDonald's. That's a huge win. Those are big. That's a great the great fries. KFC. KFC, they get Inbox Zero, and they get Lesbians. So their furniture is going to all work. <laughs> you know, everything's going to be nice, and all the all the wood's going to be well sanded. You know, unlike on our side, we're fucked. Gays crashing into each other. <laughs> <laughs> bunch of okay uh, that's into, our show for crashing today into a taco bell uh thanks to medi thanks to the uh cocaine bear we're reading message thanks, box on our phones thanks to joe biden and barack obama thanks to joe biden on. and barack obama and uh thanks to the uh thanks to lesbians for taking one for the team yep <laughs> just we'll have t- a great one everybody <laughs> bye hey friends of the pod it's joe <laughs> biden look i know you haven't heard from me in a while <laughs> Play us out, Joe. Of some lingering hard feelings from the primary. Oh my God! Well, I'm here to say, <laughs> well, that was a ranging episode. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Honestly, pretty fun. It felt like a live show. Uh, I had a good time. <laughs>